And this relationship right here holds for all Fibonacci numbers up until the A not F member. Good morning fellow mathematicians, welcome back to another video. Back at Papa Flemmy's random week and we are going to deal with a famous papa today, one of the most famous mathematical papas there is, Papa Fibonacci. Come on guys, you, you know the papa, it's that spiral boy that appears everywhere in nature, no it doesn't. But let the sheeps believe that it does. And we are going to find an expression for the nth member of this sequence right here today using linear algebra, my most favorite approach to this problem. So let's go ahead and get started. Just for clarification purposes, those numbers in here, we are going to call them members. And they are ordered, so the first one, the zero, is A0, and the next one is A1, A2, A3, and so on. I guess you can see the pattern. And how are those Fibonacci numbers constructed? Well, it's an easy pattern, to be honest. It's a recurrence relation. So the a n plus one member, so that's for example this member right here. Or just this member, let's find this member out right here. So that's the a n plus one member. And we are going to construct it as follows. We are going to take this member right here before it, so that would be the free. And then we are going to add the member before the free to it. So all that means is that we are going to take the a n member, that would be this one right here, and adding the a n minus one member to it. So the next member would be plus 2 equals to 5, at least on the real numbers, natural numbers, etc. And so on. So the next number would be 8, and so on, etc. Okay, great. And just like I said before, you want to use linear algebra to deal with this problem. So it would be nice to work with some kind of matrix or vector. The good thing is we can make a system of equations out of that right here with a real simple trick. Oh, doctors hate it. Doctors hate this guy, he found out something cool. Never mind. So, what we can do, we can add a second equation here, for example, a n is equal to a n. Sounds trivial, but that's true. And it will help us, because now we have a system of equations and we can turn it into a vector. So that means we have the first vector right here, that's that. So the first vector is a n plus 1 and a n. And this is equal to this vector right here. a n plus a n minus 1 and then a n. And we can go even further, my boys. This right here, we are having some addition here. So that looks like something. Um, for example, we took a matrix and we multiply it by a vector because of this addition. You will see in a second what I'm talking about. So we could add in the second line a zero and it wouldn't change anything. This little observation allows us to turn this into one, one, um, one and zero times a n, a n minus one. I hope you can see where this comes from. So we are taking this vector right here, placing it up here. So a n plus a n minus one, that's indeed this. And we are taking this vector, placing it here, a n plus zero. Great. And we are going to call this matrix right here, A for example, I really don't care. So this is A times A n, A n minus 1. That step right here was quite hard to explain for me because I don't know how to explain it. Never mind. I hope you could see where this came from. And we can go even further now because we have a recurrence re relation here once again. That's a hard word to say, recurrence relation. Tongue breaker. So let's put it here once again. A n plus one and a n. It's nothing but a times a n, a n minus one. And this relationship right here holds for all Fibonacci numbers up until the a not f member. So what we can do, we can use this relationship right here on this vector. So follow my thought process, so we end up with a. And now using this relationship on this vector, we end up with an a once again, right here. And what have we done? Well, we have 
a vector right here and all the indexes right here were reduced by one. So that means we end up with a n minus one and a n minus two. We can multiply a and a together to get a squared in that case times a n minus one, a n minus two. And we can keep repeating this n times, for example. So we end up with a to the nth power and then we would end up with the less two members, with a vector of the less two members. So that would be just a one and a naught. Try it out for yourself that you have to do nth iterations. But we know what a one and a naught are. Those are just one and zero. And our goal is it now to read the expressions of a n plus one and a n in one straight line. So that's our goal for now. And that's quite easy. All we really have to do is to diagonalize a to the nth power. But for reasons that will become clear in the end, it's enough to diagonalize this a right here, this matrix a. That makes it way easier. So what does diagonalization mean? We are going to take this matrix a right here and multiplying it by some special matrix s and we are going to end up with s times some other matrix t in that case. What we can also do, we can multiply both sides only under the condition that s is invertible. That means that the determinant of s isn't equal to zero. That also means that a is nothing but s times t times s to the negative one, so the inverse of s. And this is also equivalent to saying we have inverse of s times a times s will be equal to t. And our goal is it for now to find out t. We are going to play around with the characteristic polynomial with the eigenvectors, eigenvalues to find an expression for t. So in order for us to find out this matrix s, we have to find out, uh, out the eigenvectors of this a right here. And we are going to do this by using the characteristic polynomial. So this characteristic polynomial is denoted by this she right here of a with those lambdas and it's the following. It's just the determinant of a minus some lambdas, those are the eigenvalues, times this one matrix right here, the multiplicative identity of the matrices. So if we compute that, we are going to end up with one minus lambda. This is just going to be one, one and minus lambda. And also this is going to be the determinant, putting it into absolute values. So what's the determinant of that thing? That's quite easy to compute. We end up with, okay, multiplying those two together, we end up with lambda squared minus lambda and then subtracting the multiplication of one and one. So subtracting one. And we want this characteristic polynomial to be equal to zero. Okay, nice. Finding the zeros of this is quite easy. So just use the um, ABC formula, Mitternacht's formula, PQ formula, whatever you want to use. That means lambda one and two are nothing but, okay, so we have one half plus minus square root of one over four plus one. This is going to be, okay, we have one half plus minus square root of um, five over four. This is just going to be one plus minus the square root of five over two. Okay, so those are the eigenvalues and those are two famous boys. We are going to denote the first eigenvalue, lambda one, as being the positive branch right here and it's going to be called phi, the golden ratio, and lambda two is the negative branch right here. It's phi's little brother, like three blue, one brown would say, I don't know what it's called. It's the conjugate of phi or something. Okay, great, so we have found that out. And now we want to compute the eigenvectors for those eigenvalues. So let's plug in um, the first eigenvalue right here to compute the eigenvectors. What does eigenvector mean? Well, we are going to take this right here, this argument, a minus and now lambda one, which is just phi, so phi times the one matrix. I seriously don't know what it's called right now. I'm terribly sorry. And then we are going to multiply it by some vector v1, for example. And we want this right here, the system of equations, to be equal to zero, the null vector. So that's what we want. 
we can compute that. That's not quite hard. And we are going to um, make this v1 just be, for example, x and y. OK, that's all there really is to it. So computing that leaves us with uh, 1 minus phi, 1, 1 minus phi in that case, times x and y. Multiplying this together leaves us with x minus phi times x plus y. So taking this vector, placing it on top, adding those together, and then also x minus y times phi. OK. Now we have a system of equations, and we want this to be equal to 0 and 0. Let's put it here once again. Now we have x minus phi times x plus y must be equal to 0, and also x minus phi times y must be equal to 0. Let's deal with this equation right here. We can bring phi times y to the other side, so that means x will be equal to phi times y. Now we can make a wild guess. You can also solve this right here, but this is way easier. If we let y be equal to 1, for example, that also means that x will be equal to phi in that case. If you plug those values into here, we end up with, OK, so we have phi minus phi squared plus 1 in that case will be equal to 0. We can multiply both sides by minus 1 because it's not equal to 0. That also means that we have phi squared minus phi minus 1 is equal to 0. And by our, by our starting condition, those are the eigenvalues of the system right here, this holds. So we have constructed our first eigenvector, v1, which is just phi and 1. And we can go through the same procedure with phi conjugate, little brother of phi. So once I wrote out this expression, the name for this thing came to my mind, it's the identity matrix. I'm stupid, my English isn't too good today. So just like before, we are going to multiply those together. So we end up with a minus phi conjugate times a plus b. And then also we are going to have a minus phi conjugate times b must be equal to 0, 0. Once again, we are going to have a system of equations. And just like before, one equation is going to be a minus phi conjugate times b will be equal to 0. Bringing this to the other side leaves us with a being equal to phi conjugate times b. And letting b be equal to 1 means that, that a is indeed equal to phi conjugate. And if you plug those values in, you are indeed going to end up with the same result. So that means that our phi 2 will be uh, v2 will be phi conjugate and 1. So that's all there really is to it. And now we are going to construct our s. That means that our s is nothing but this v1 vector and also our v2 vector. This means we are going to end up with phi, phi conjugate, 1 and 1. So this right here is indeed our s. We have constructed it out of our eigenvectors. And now we want to also find the inverse of this s right here. So that was one of the main goals. So that means the inverse of s is nothing but 1 over determinant of s times. And now we have to take, um, we have to switch positions of those right here. I hope you guys know how to take the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. So we are ending up with 1 and phi right here. And then negative phi conjugate, negative 1. What's the determinant of s? Well, this is just phi minus phi uh, conjugate. So phi minus phi conjugate is just 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 minus 1 minus square root of 5 over 2. And this is going to leave us with this, and that is going to cancel out. We have 2 times square root of 5 over 2. So this is just square root of 5 in this case. So we end up with 1 over square root of 5. And then times 1 minus phi conjugate minus 1 phi. And now we have constructed all the tools that we really need to find out our t. Because remember, t is nothing but inverse of s times a times s. And we are going to compute this now. I guess this right here is going to be the hardest part of all the calculations. So let's start off with the first matrix multiplication right here. So we're going to end up with 1 over square root of 5 
and also 1 minus phi conjugate minus 1 phi. So this is going to be, we are taking this right here, so this is just phi plus 1. And then for the next one, we are going to end up with, um, for the next entry, that would be this right here, phi conjugate plus 1. And this right here is just going to be phi, and the next one is going to be phi conjugate. I hope you guys know how matrix multiplication works. And now we have to multiply this and that together. So we end up with 1 over square root of 5 and then times. So placing this on that right here, so we have phi plus 1 and that and minus phi conjugate phi. And the next one, this is going to be phi conjugate plus 1 and then minus phi conjugate squared. This is um, phi squared minus phi minus 1. And the last one is going to be phi conjugate phi and then minus phi conjugate minus 1. I hope I don't look spastic. That's just how I multiply stuff together on the chalkboard when it comes to matrices. Never mind. The good thing is we know what those entries are. Those are going to be exactly zero. Those were our conditions for phi and phi conjugate. Remember? So this right here is going to be zero. Now we just have to compute this and that right here. It would be nice to compute this right here at first, this little product. So what is phi conjugate times phi? Um, times phi. This is just 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 times 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. Well, this is going to leave us with, that's the difference of two squares, so the formula. So this is 1 minus 4 over, uh, minus 5 over 4. So this is minus 4 over 4 is just minus 1. So this is minus 1 and this is minus 1. So now we end up with 1 over square root of 5 and also we have uh, minus and minus 1 is positive 1, so 5 plus 2. Here's a 0, here's a 0. And we have minus 1, minus 1, that's minus 2. So we have minus 5 conjugate, minus 2. And now we just have to find out the values of this right here. And we also could bring this 1 over square root of 5 inside. Mm, let's do that later. But what is 1 over square root of 5? Let's bring it into a proper form. Uh, we can advance this fraction by square root of 5 over square root of 5. So we end up with a 5 down here in the denominator and the square root of 5 in the numerator. So let's find those values out. 5 plus 2, this is nothing but 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 plus 2. But what is a 2? It's just 4 over 2. We can bring this together to end up with 5 plus square root of 5 over 2. Same spiel here, minus phi conjugate minus 2 is nothing but, so we end up with minus 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 minus 4 over 2. Once again, we can bring this together to end up with square root of 5 um, minus 4 minus 5 over 2. Okay, that's a lot of calculations. And now we can distribute the square root of 5 over 5 into here. So using this right here, square root of 5 over 5. Well, this is going to leave us with 5 times square root of 5. Square root of 5 times square root of 5 is just 5. So this is plus 5 times 1. I'm putting it that way. 5 times 2. This and that and that is going to cancel out. Same thing down here. So multiplying this by that leaves us with um, we have 5 times 1 minus square root of 5 times 5 over 5 times 2. This, that, and that is going to cancel out. So this up here is just our phi, and this down here is our phi conjugate. So all in all, this is going to leave us with phi, 0, 0, phi conjugate. That's a nice diagonalized matrix. So our t has only entries on the main diagonal. So that was the goal of diagonalization. That's why it's called that way. And we're going to use this now. So for the last part. In the beginning, I said that it's enough to diagonalize our a so that we can find out the value for a to the nth power. Why did I say that? Let's take a look at a to the nth power. a to the nth power is nothing but, well, what is a? a is s times t 
times the inverse of s to the nth power. We can use this nth power on everything, so we end up with s times t, s to the minus 1 times s times t, s to the minus 1 times s, dot dot dot, doing this n times, and then we have s t s to the minus 1. We also have a s to the minus 1 here. And as you might notice, this is going to cancel out this, blah, 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 this. And we are going to end up with this t right here, n times. So we have s t to the nth power, s to the minus 1. And that's nice. Because we have the value for our a, and if we raise it to the nth power, we end up with t to the nth power. And you can trust me on this, you can try it out three or four times for yourself. t to the nth power is nothing but phi to the nth power, zero, zero, phi conjugate to the nth power. And that's nice, that's nice. So we have computed that, and now we can compute our actual recurrence relation. So let's go ahead and get started. a n plus one, a n, where, what is that? That is a to the nth power, 1 and 0, which is just s t s to the minus 1, so t to the nth power in this case, 1 and 0. And we are going to compute this one after another. So we have this 1 over square root of 5 term. We can bring it to the front, basically. It's just a scalar, so we can bring it to the front. So the first thing we want to compute is uh, 1 over square root of 5. And then we have our s, our t to the nth power, and we also have, so what was that? That was 1 minus phi conjugate. We have our minus 1, phi times 1, 0. And calculating this is quite easy. So we are going to end up with a 1 and a minus 1. So this is 1 over square root of 5. Then we have our s. t to the nth power is just this expression right here. Phi to the n, 0, 0, phi conjugate to the nth power. And this is 1 and minus 1. Computing this is also quite easy. We end up with 1 over square root of 5. What is our s? s was nothing but phi, phi conjugate 1, 1. And multiplying this together leaves us with phi to the nth power. Multiplying this together leaves us with phi conjugate to the nth power, but with a negative sign. Okay, now we just have to multiply those together. So we end up with 1 over square root of 5 and then times. So we have this right here, this is phi to the n, and we also have this term, multiplying those together, so n plus 1 power, and then minus phi conjugate to the n plus 1 power. And multiplying this together is phi to the nth power minus phi conjugate to the nth power. And then we are done. So we have found our expressions for a n plus 1 and a n. And just like I said in the beginning, we can read our ex expressions in one line. So it means if you draw a line, for example, here, you can see a n is nothing but 1 over square root of 5 times phi to the nth power minus phi conjugate to the nth power. Same thing up here. And one famous exercise is to find out the limiting ratio between a n plus 1 and a n. Let's do this real quick. Calculating the limiting ratio is quite easy. So we are just taking the ratio of a n plus 1 and a n and then using the limit as n approaches infinity. I plugged all the necessary information in. 1 over square root of 5 was a common factor, so I was able to cancel it out. So that's nice. What we can do now, we can factor out phi to the n plus 1 power and phi to the nth power out on the numerator and denominator. So we end up with limit as n approaches infinity of phi to the n plus 1 power over phi to the nth power times. Now we have a 1 minus phi conjugate to the n plus 1 power over phi to the n plus 1 power. We can factor out the n plus 1 power to end up with 1 minus phi conjugate over phi but to the n plus 1 power over 1 minus phi conjugate over phi to the nth power. Okay, nice. This phi to the nth power and this is going to cancel out, so we end up with a scalar phi. We can bring it to the front because it's not affected by the limit. So we have phi times the limit as n approaches infinity of this chunk right here. 1 minus phi conjugate over phi to the n plus 1 power over 1 minus phi conjugate over phi to the nth power. I'm running out of chalk right here. <laughs> now let's take a look at 
phi conjugate over phi. What actually is that? Phi conjugate over phi. So we know that this 1 over 2 somewhere, never mind, is a common factor. Um, let's put it here at first. So this is 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 over 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. I, I thought I had it somewhere here. Doesn't matter. What I wanted to say is that this right here is a common factor. It's going to cancel out. So we end up with 1 minus square root of 5 over 1 plus square root of 5. And the numerator right here is less than the de denominator, obviously. So we end up with a fraction. I don't know if it's negative. Let's just say that the absolute value of phi conjugate over phi is less than 1. What it also means is that this is a fraction. And if we raise a fraction to the infinity power, so letting n approach infinity, we end up with 1 over, for example, 2 to the infinity. That's 1 over infinity. It's going to 0 in the limit. So this is going to 0 in the limit, and this is going to 0 in the limit. That means we end up with 1 over 1, which is just 1. So the limiting ratio is phi. And that's why it's so famous. So for those Fibonacci numbers in the limit, the ratio between all those numbers is our irrational boy phi. I hope you did like this video. That was quite an effort. I had to re-record it quite often because, I don't know, I'm too stupid or something. I'm not the smartest boy out there. If you did enjoy this video, please like and subscribe and recommend me if you like. If you want to support me a bit more, link to my Patreon will be in the description. And up until the next video, have a flammable day. See ya! Oh,